I'd now like to introduce Judy Woodruff, uh, the anchor and managing director of the PBS NewsHour, who is going to tell us about our next honoree. Judy, it's all yours. Thank you, Robert Siegel. Oh, goodness. <laughs> My heel just been, went between the sections of the... Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you, Robert Siegel, legendary journalist. We love you. We miss you on the air. Don't we love this man? <laughs> Congratulations to all the other award winners tonight, Aviva Kempner, of course, uh, to incredible journalists who are being honored, and you'll hear about them in, in just a moment. Nina Totenberg, icon, uh, Nina, uh, and Evan Osnos, uh, such a gifted writer, and I can't wait to, uh, to hear uh, the tributes to you. I'm, I am thrilled to be here this evening to present, uh, not only to present uh, the next uh, award, but to celebrate a free and independent press. There's never been a time when we've needed to celebrate that more than we do right now. And to celebrate, of course, Moment Magazine. But the reason I'm here is to present the Moment Trailblazer Award to someone who really does define the word trailblazer. The person we recognize has been knocking down doors and asking tough questions throughout her life. Growing up in Brooklyn, with grandparents who emigrated from Russia and Poland, she has described her mother and her older sister as important role models in her life. Both of them had careers, and as our honoree decided her interest lay in psychology, she earned a master's degree, she turned to working in policy, and almost immediately pointed out how little was being done around women and their treatment in the field of psychology and psychiatry. Long before it was cool to support women in politics, our nominee was going out of her way to raise money for women candidates. She made time to work for them and for the Equal Rights Amendment, even as she pursued her full-time career. But it was at the Society for Women's Health Research that she found her niche. There, starting in the early 1990s, she literally began to put women's health on the map. She and other founders saw that women and minorities were not included in most clinical trials. The Society was the first organization that raised the question, how is health research on men relevant to women? Asking that question and a lot of hard work and hard lobbying led to federal legislation being passed that required the inclusion of women and minorities in clinical trials as well as incorporating analysis of sex and ethnic differences into research at the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. The work she has done and led has paved the way for huge, life-saving changes for women in this country and around the world. Women having a better shot at the right treatment, physicians and researchers now taking it as a given that women's health issues and needs are so often, not always, but so often different from those of men. Now, as a senior vice president for Healthy Women, the nation's leading nonprofit health information source for women, she continues to be a fierce advocate for women and minorities. Her work has been her passion throughout her life, and she's done it all while raising a remarkable family. Three accomplished sons, at least one of whom is here tonight. Peter, where are you, and are there others? Are they all here? All three of the boys are here. Please stand. <laughs> Please stand. Your mom will talk about you in a minute. <laughs> Raising these three accomplished young men and married to a phenomenal journalist with the Wall Street Journal for so many years, Robert Greenberger, after whom, as we know, a Moment Award was named. She is now, after so many years, Bob's caregiver and constant companion, and we all admire and love her so much for what she is doing and what she gives every day to Bob. I am so proud to present the Moment Trailblazer Award to my dear friend, Phyllis Greenberger. Well, 
thank you. Thank you, Judy, and thank you for moment for this recognition. I'm truly honored to be here this evening, and I thank you to my friends and colleagues here tonight who also share this recognition with me. And of course, I want to, of course, Judy just did, but I just want to thank my sons and my daughter-in-laws for being here as well. And there's a table of uh, my, the, the uh, colleagues that I work with at Healthy Women, so this, this award is for me and for them as well. So Judy told you a little bit about, about my history. I'm gonna go through it a little bit more and briefly. So I wanna take you, uh, <laughs> I think we can do it briefly. I'd like to take you through some of the history of women's health and sex discrimination. And although it began thousands of years ago, I've only been involved since 1990. This discrimination is not focused on reproductive rights or sex discrimination as currently defined but sex discrimination in healthcare and research that often led to misdiagnosis and inappropriate care, often with negative or tragic results for women. For thousands of years, every medical disorder suffered by women was one way or another attributed to her uterus. In fact, the word hysteria is derived from the Greek word uterus. In Europe, for hundreds of years, every female medical disorder was blamed on her uterus, and in extreme cases, women were forced to enter an asylum or undergo a hysterectomy. It wasn't until 1953 that the American Psychiatric Association dropped the term. And clearly, not quite as extreme, but how many women over the years have been told that their complaints, pain or otherwise, was all in their head? Excuse me for a second. It was all in their head, and, and had a trip, and, and had their, their complaints attributed to mental health issues, and been referred to psychiatrists. The misconception by doctors and researchers that men and women were the same, except for their reproductive organs, and that their hearts, lungs, and bone structure were similar resulted in the medical community believing that trials conducted just on men could be extrapolated to women. In fact, in 1977, the FDA issued a mandate that women should be excluded from all trials, and women weren't included until 1993, even when the conditions studied were more prevalent in women. The recognition of the absence of women in clinical trials first came in the Public Health Service report in 1985 that found that women's health was being adversely affected by the lack of research on women at the National Institutes of Health. It recommended that the behavior, biology, and the social factors that influenced women's health should be included in research. This report stayed dormant until 1990, when the Society of Women's Health, where I was CEO, asked Congress to submit a letter to the Government Accountability Office requesting an, an investigation to determine if their mandate was being followed. The answer, of course, was no. That year, legislation, that, that year, legislation mandating the inclusion of women in research and clinical trials both passed, passed both houses. Although vetoed by President George H.W. Bush, women's health office were established in all federal agencies along with the directive to the NIH to include women in clinical trials. This legislation was eventually passed in 1993 and, designed and signed by President Clinton. The next significant milestone was when the Institute of Medicine, the scientific arm of the federal government, agreed to our request to form a commission to investigate the existence and importance of sex differences. The resulting 2011 report, quote, Biological Contributions to Human Health, Does Sex Matter?, validated the importance of including women and minorities in clinical trials, finding that, quote, every cell has a sex and research needs to be conducted from womb to tomb. A series of investigations followed, beginning with the Food and Drug Administration, resulting in additional mandates to the agencies and a director from the NIH to include women and minorities in clinical trials and analyze for sex and ethnic differences. It wasn't until 2014 that the director of NIH finally mandated that basic research had to use female cells and female animals. Up until then, had all been male. Like women, 
Female animals have hormone cycles, get pregnant, and are more complicated than, than their male counterparts. No surprise there. And it wasn't until this year, 2019, that the FDA Office on Devices and Diagnostics promulgated mandates to consider sex and gender differences in research for diagnostics. So I think I'm running out of time, I'm making it brief, um, and I, but I hope I've succeeded in presenting just a very quick overview of 30 years of advocacy. Today we know many medications affect men and women differently. In fact, one heart medication was taken off the market because it caused heart failure in, in women. Today, Healthy Women continues to advocate and educate on these issues, including expanding research on sex differences in conditions such as migraines, heart disease, chronic pain, addiction, and Alzheimer's. In many cases, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment are different for men and women. Remember when heart attacks were man's disease. So the journey continues. There's still a lot we don't know and challenges to face but we've come a long way, and I want to thank you again for this recognition. Thank you.